Hello, my name is Madeline and I am an interpreter at the Charles Lindbergh House and Museum. This presentation is focused on the complicated legacy of Charles Lindbergh. We will begin by discussing historical presentism. What is it and how does it apply to Charles Lindbergh? Historical presentism poses the question, should we judge historical figures by today's moral standards? Charles Lindbergh was born in Detroit, Michigan in 1902. His mother, Evangeline, was a recent college graduate and a chemistry teacher at the Little Falls High School. His father, Charles August Lindbergh, or CA as his friends would call him, was a prominent Minnesota politician and lawyer. When World War I broke out in 1914, C.A. Lindbergh Sr. vocally opposed United States involvement. He argued that only the bankers and other wealth grabbers would benefit from a war with Germany. In 1917, C.A. published Why Is Your Country at War, a book in which he blamed the inner circle of the wealthiest for pushing the nation into the conflict. His anti-war writings and speeches during World War I caused him to be branded as a traitor and affected the outcome of the 1918 gubernatorial election. At the time, Lindbergh was prevented from speaking in many parts of the state and was opposed by many powerful public opinion forming agencies in the state. CA ran for a seat in the United States Senate in 1916 and ran as a Republican candidate for governor in Minnesota. Both attempts were unsuccessful. In 1924, C.A. ran again, but died shortly after. C.A. wrote adamantly against the enfranchisement of African Americans and believed that African Americans, by nature, were inferior to the white race. In his opinion, it had been a mistake to allow African Americans the right to vote. C.A. believed that there should be a separate state for the African American population where they might exercise national character and rapidly improve a higher morality. Lastly, C.A. believed that interracial marriage would not elevate the white race, but would eventually lift the black. C.A.'s beliefs would have influenced his young son Charles throughout his life, from his involvement in the America First Committee as an isolationist, and his problematic beliefs in eugenics and replacement theory. Charles Lindbergh's mother, Evangeline Lodge Land, also harbored negative opinions towards Jewish people. Eva Lindbergh, Charles's half-sister, documented times where she was not allowed to play with certain children if they were Jewish when the family resided in Minneapolis. Charles Lindbergh was also influenced by a prominent scientist, Dr. Alexis Carell. The two men became friends in 1935. Carell was considered the father of transplant and won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1912. Born in France, Carell came to the United States to work at the Rockefeller Institute to research organ transplantation. In the 1930s, Dr. Carell met Charles Lindbergh to develop a pump that would allow organs to thrive and oxygenate outside of the body. The men experimented on a cat kept the cat's thyroid alive for 30 days and its heart going for 12 hours. Dr. Alexis Carell was also known for his belief in eugenics. Carell wrote extensively about the condition of man in his book, Man the Unknown. In his book, he advocates for, quote, the euthanasia of criminals through the use of gases. Carell's book also promotes the idea of selective breeding to promote the strong. Carell believed that the only way to, quote, obviate the disastrous predominance of the weak is to develop the strong. His views dovetailed with his work at the Rockefeller Foundation, which, until 1939, funded research used to support Nazi racial ideologies. Carell retired from the Rockefeller Institute in 1938, where he conducted eugenics research. However, this would not be the end of his research. In 1941, he accepted a grant from Nazi-occupied Vichy France to set up an institute in Paris where he would continue to examine the problems of man. After the liberation of France, Carell was considered to have collaborated with the Nazis and would likely have been brought to trial if he had not died in 1944. Lindbergh said he considered Carell to have a most stimulating mind and his time with Carell to be the most thrilling intellectual adventure of his life. Carell's study of eugenics reflected in the writings of Lindbergh, 
particularly his publication of Aviation, Geography, and Race in Reader's Digest. In this article, Lindbergh laid out a worldview based on the domination of the white race. In Lindbergh's view, France, England, Nazi Germany, and the United States represent a, quote, Western wall of race and arms against foreign races, oriental guns, and the infiltration of inferior blood. According to historian Dr. Lloyd Gardner, his desire to spread his healthy genes and belief in eugenics led to secret affairs with three German women that produced seven children. As Europe crept toward war, the United States was determined to remain neutral. Still, the US military asked Lindbergh to go to Germany to assess the German Luftwaffe. Charles made four trips to Germany and even attended the Berlin Olympics in 1936. While his trips produced intel for the United States, the Germans took full advantage of the aviator's presence by showboating the aviation achievements of the German nation. Lindbergh developed a deep appreciation for Hitler and Germany. In a letter written to Harry Davison in 1937, Lindbergh said Hitler was, quote, undoubtedly a great man and believed that Hitler has done much for the German people. In October 1938, while on a visit to Germany, Lindbergh received the service cross of the Order of the German Eagle at the direction of Adolf Hitler. Lindbergh treated the medal like any other he received. He never wore it, but he also declined to return it despite a public backlash. In 1941, Lindbergh donated his medal to a museum in St. Louis, where it is currently in their collections. Less than a month after the presenting of the medal, the Nazis orchestrated a brutal assault on Jews that came to be known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. Nazis and their sympathizers smashed the windows of Jewish businesses, burned homes and synagogues, and left scores dead. Between 20,000 and 30,000 Jews were arrested and sent to concentration camps. The Limburgs had wanted to make Berlin their permanent residence. However, Charles stated, quote, I do not wish to cause embarrassment to our government or to the German government. The Limburgs decided to cancel their plans to move to Germany and resided instead in France until 1938. In 1940, a group of Yale University students founded the America First Committee to oppose US intervention in the European war. They quickly mobilized hundreds of other anti-war students to join the organization and persuaded one of the nation's most outspoken isolationists. Lindbergh's enormous celebrity helped the America First Committee become a national organization with as many as 800,000 members. As early as 1934, the Roosevelt administration began compiling a list of American right-wingers and Nazi sympathizers. By September of 1939, Lindbergh joined the FBI's watch list. From September 1939 to April of 1941, FBI informants attended his speeches and monitored his activities with the America First movement. At these speeches, the informants would track notable celebrities in attendance, the amount of money raised, and the size and demographics of the crowd. Along with monitoring Lindbergh's speeches, the FBI also kept a watchful eye on the American press for articles by and about Lindbergh. On September 11th, 1941, Charles Lindbergh made a speech in Des Moines, Iowa that would forever change his image. Speaking at an America First Assembly, Lindbergh asserted that there are three groups responsible for pressuring the US to enter World War II, these so-called war agitators. These three groups were the British, the Roosevelt administration, and the Jews. Overlooking the unprovoked German invasion of Poland, Lindbergh blamed England for starting the war. He asserted that England was not large enough or strong enough to win the war on its own. Quote, if England can draw this country into the war, he concluded, she can shift to our shoulders a large portion of the responsibility for waging it and for paying the cost. Lindbergh then went on to say that even if America entered the war, it is not possible for the Allied armies to invade Europe and overwhelm the Axis powers. Lastly, Lindbergh stated that England had spent large amounts of money for propaganda in America during the present war. 
Lindbergh also accused the Roosevelt administration of using dictatorial procedures to obtain a third presidential term and add billions of dollars of debt. Lindbergh stated, quote, the danger of the Roosevelt administration lies in its subterfuge. While its members have promised us peace, they have led us to war, heedless of the platform upon which they were elected. Most notoriously, Lindbergh accused the Jews of pushing the United States toward war. Lindbergh stated that it was not difficult to understand why the Jews wanted to overthrow Nazi Germany, given Nazi persecution. Lindbergh stated that he believed that Jews pose a danger to this country because of their large ownership and influence in, quote, motion pictures, our press, our radio, and our government. Lindbergh also stated, quote, we cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other people to lead our country to destruction. Jewish communities around the country immediately responded to Lindbergh's accusations. The American Jewish Committee and the Jewish Labor Committee denounced Lindbergh by declaring the speech low and baseless. Furthermore, the Jewish people rejected his un-American appeal to his selfish interests. The American Jewish Congress issued a statement stating that the American Jews will neither be bribed or blackmailed into renouncing their just and equal status as citizens of the United States. Other prominent people were quick to denounce Lindbergh's speech as well. Famed children's author Theodore Geisel, otherwise known as Dr. Seuss, wrote political cartoons during the wartime era. Dr. Seuss targeted Lindbergh in numerous political cartoons that accused the aviator of being a puppet of the Third Reich. Lindbergh's private feelings mirrored his anti-Jewish public statements. In his wartime journals, Lindbergh wrote unfavorably of Jewish people in many entries. Portions of these journals were redacted by Lindbergh for publication. However, the uncensored journals are available to researchers consulting the Lindbergh papers at Yale University. After the violence of Kristallnacht, Lindbergh expressed frustration with Germany, stating, quote, My admiration of the Germans is constantly being dashed against some rock such as this. At the same time, Lindbergh blamed the Jews for the violence they endured. Lindbergh stated that, quote, Jewish pressure on Germany, combined with an inherent German hatred of the Jews, led Germany to persecute them. The America First Committee collapsed after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor. When Lindbergh wished to re-enlist in the United States Air Force, he was met with an adamant rejection from the Roosevelt administration, still questioning where Lindbergh's loyalty was. Lindbergh went to work for Henry Ford at the Willow Run Bomber Plant, where he conducted aerospace design and test flights. He later flew 50 combat missions as a civilian advisor in the Pacific. Still, Lindbergh never wavered from his view that American participation in World War II was a mistake. Reflecting back in 1969, he wrote, quote, we won the war in a military sense, but in a broader sense, it seems to me that we lost it. Much of our Western culture was destroyed. We lost the genetic heredity formed through aeons. Charles Lindbergh's speeches attracted a lot of attention from white supremacist and pro-Nazi groups before World War II. One of the most prominent was Father Charles Coughlin. Coughlin was a Roman Catholic priest whose radio programs attracted an estimated 30 million listeners. Although he did not start out as an anti-Semitic broadcaster, by the late 1930s, he was speaking out in support of the Nazis and blaming Jews for a host of political and economic troubles, even promoting the debunked conspiracy theory that predicted world domination by the Jews. Charles Coughlin distributed a magazine called Social Justice. In 1940, the magazine featured Lindbergh's face and excerpts from his speeches, while Coughlin boasted that Lindbergh was a true American patriot who could be the next president of the United States. The second group to use Lindbergh's image was the Silver Shirts, another white supremacist organization that thought Nazism could translate to American politics. Founded by William Dudley Pelley, the Silver Shirts which boasted around 15,000 members, dreamed of a white utopia that excluded non-whites and Jews. Pelley wrote a letter to General George Van Horn Mosley in April of 1941, stating that he believed Lindbergh would serve in one of the highest positions if American Nazism was achieved, providing, quote, glamour to assure the interest of the public. 
Interestingly, Lindbergh was called to the sedition trial of William Dudley Pelly as a defense witness. Lindbergh took the stand, but neither defended nor condemned the actions of Pelly. Instead, Lindbergh told prosecutors that there were a lot of people against the United States joining the war. Historians continue to investigate connections between Lindbergh and Pelly, and there is no clear answer as to why Pelly wanted Lindbergh to testify on his behalf. The last group to lionize Lindbergh was the German American Bund. It was the largest pro-Nazi organization in the US, tallying about 30,000 members at one point. The group supported the Nazi regime and practiced its own version of American Nazism, including fielding paramilitary units armed with clubs and costuming its members in uniforms and swastika armbands. It was large enough to run several summer camps for American Nazi youth and even sent its best and brightest to Germany for indoctrination. The Bundes publication, Free American, urged its readers to become members of the America First Committee. After Lindbergh's speech in September of 1941, other events by the America First Committee began to attract Coughlinites, Bundists, and Silver Shirts. Historian Wayne Cole wrote that many anti-Semites within America First ranks and on its fringes interpreted the address as an invitation to use the committee as a vehicle for spreading their anti-Semitic ideas. After the Des Moines speech, America First rallies became littered with Nazi symbols and propaganda. Nazi German propaganda commended the America First Committee and called it true Americanism and true patriotism. Organizations such as the American Bund Movement, the Silver Shirts, and the Coughlinites collapsed after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941. Despite the collapse of these organizations, American Nazism persisted. Nazis attempted to march and rally in Skokie, Illinois in 1978. Today, some in the alt-right have taken up the mantle of white supremacy and Nazism in the United States. The anti-Semitic Unite the Right rally march in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017, and more recently, the presence of Camp Auschwitz and 6MWE, 6 million wasn't enough, t-shirts at the siege of the US Capitol in January 2021, shows that strains of Nazism and anti-Semitism are alive and well in the United States in the 21st century. White supremacists continue to exploit Lindbergh's image and views today. Notably, the American Freedom Party, formerly known as America Third Position, is led by a group of white nationalists. A3P uses Lindbergh's image and echoes Lindbergh's words to promote white supremacist ideas to their members. A3P promotes Lindbergh's ideology from his article in Reader's Digest, Aviation, Geography, and Race, warning of the infiltration of inferior blood and the necessary preservation of the white race. It is important for us to remember Charles Lindbergh's breathtaking solo flight in 1927, his technological genius, his civilian service in World War II, his concern for the environment, and his personal family tragedy. But we should also recognize the impact of his words and actions on the United States, for better and for worse, both during his life and today. Lindbergh's legacy is problematic. His beliefs in eugenics and his anti-Semitic sentiments are two critical issues that have not disappeared from American society. In 2021, Jewish communities in the United States were the most targeted religious group. The Anti-Defamation League recorded 3,697 incidents of anti-Semitism in the United States, a 36% increase from 2021. This is the highest number on record since ADL began tracking anti-Semitic incidents in 1979. The idea of eugenics is an old idea with a violent history. Eugenicists sought to improve the human population and its gene pool through encouraging fit individuals to procreate, positive eugenics, and discouraging or preventing the reproduction of the unfit, negative eugenics. This led to the forced sterilization of thousands of Americans, and in the case of Nazi Germany, the justification for murdering millions of people. 20th century eugenics is still prominent in American society today. Between 1973 and 1976, 
the United States government authorized the sterilization of 3,406 Native American women without their consent. More recently, the United States executed the forced sterilization of women at ICE detention centers at the border between the U.S. and Mexico. Lastly, eugenics ideals impacted the COVID-19 pandemic. During the pandemic, we placed different values on people's lives using oppressive definitions of quality and treated people differently based on their health status. Examples include placing a lower value on life because a person is older, disabled, or overweight. As historians, we talk about historical presentism and judge the actions of the past by the moral standards of today because we rely on the past as a comparative guidepost to values we wish to hold in the present. It's important to note that those who say we shouldn't judge people in the past by the moral standards of today often overlook the reality that there has not now or ever been a unified moral standard of the past, not today and not in Lindbergh's time. Americans in the 1930s held widely different opinions about the treatment of Jews, and many people were horrified by Lindbergh's views even then. The condemnation of Lindbergh by Harold Ickes, Dr. Seuss, Franklin Roosevelt, and the public suggest that his racism was no more acceptable than it is today. Furthermore, the public condemnation of Lindbergh by Jewish organizations reveals that anti-Semitism was still very prominent in American society, despite the widely publicized atrocities that the Nazis were committing against the Jews. If we are to conclude anything, it's that moral standards of the past, whether good or bad, are not really in the past. Special thanks to the Laura Jane Musser Fund for making this and other educational videos possible. If you enjoyed this presentation, please come visit us at the Charles Lindbergh House and Museum.